All right, everybody, we're going to get this panel started here, and we have one video, which is cool. All right, so what we're going to try to do here in the next few minutes is we're going to talk about what the role of sync licensing brands and partnerships with brands uh, adds to the international uh, distribution, international marketing of music from the Asian region. So with that said, I'm going to I'm going to have everybody just introduce themselves really briefly and tell us who they work for and what they do. So, June, I'm going to start with you. Okay, I'm June Zan and I work for ATP International and uh, currently ATP International represents a plate network a uh, background music service for venues like uh, Global Starbucks, uh, Uniqlo or like uh, Nike chain stores. So currently we represent the, uh, this uh, service uh, and expanding in Asia. And, uh, and the other thing is uh, I also work for AdShare. It's a monetization service and uh, uh, fingerprinting on uh, video platforms like YouTube, Dailymotion, and SoundCloud. And we find you the, uh, the extra money you cannot find on YouTube like uh, UGC money. So this is the currently I can share with you. And uh, yeah, that's it. Good. And you also have pretty deep connections with a lot of the, um, a lot of the labels in the uh, uh, Mandy Pop region, right? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, because I'm from Taiwan, so uh, Taiwan is a big exporter uh, of uh, Mandel Pop to to uh, the global uh, Mandarin uh, Mandarin speaking uh, community, like. Of course, China, the biggest, uh, you know, market. Uh, we've been there like uh, over three decades. So yeah, we know the best. Okay, very good. So that's what we're going to focus on with you for Ooh. this session. Okay, <laughs> I have to focus everybody. Okay, so next we have uh, Lauren. Lauren, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hello, and um, a little bit about what you do. Um, oh. uh, turn it on if it's not on. Should be okay. Hello, everybody. Hi. Um, so my name's Lauren Coker. I work at Sony Music Japan in Tokyo. And the Japanese Sony Music is somewhat uh, separate and a bit more diverse in terms of business areas than all the other Sony Musics in the world. And at Sony Music Japan in Tokyo, I work in business development. And that involves a lot of projects that are across our different spheres of business. So maybe the live division, the merchandise, the label. Um, we also do mobile games. We make anime. Um, and so it's very diverse, but it's very focused on the large Japanese music market, which is right. the second biggest in the world. And um, so that really affects our decision making because up until now we've been focused very inward. Right. Um, but bit by bit, there's there's interesting projects happening internationally. So I you know want to bring up some of those examples and so on today. But Which we'll yeah, do. That's me. Good. Cool. Mandar. I'm Mandar Thakur. Um, I I run a independent music publishing and record company um, out of India. It's called Times Music. Um, we also sub-publish for Warner Chapel, for Peer Music, Vixen, and Cloud9 in the India and South Asia region. Uh, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Charlie Hyun Cho. I'm from YG Entertainment. I actually lead the YG Singapore office looking after expanding the YG brands into South Asia market, basically. Excellent. Sorry I didn't introduce you, Charlie. I didn't know you were going to end so abruptly. I'm like, oh, oh my gosh, you just <laughs> ended right there. I'll talk more. <laughs> <laughs> like, wait, hey. <laughs> but anyway, so, so, so basically what we have here is we have a, a really good cross-section of um, East and South Asia and a lot of great content from the region. So why don't we just get into it? I'm going to ask all of you one question from your perspective. What's your perception of SYNC and brand partnerships in regards to its role in helping to get your music out to the rest of the world. And I'll start, uh, I'll start with you, Charlie. Um, I think, I mean, as you know, YG is actually a K-pop uh, entertainment company located in Korea. Uh, we are one of the leading uh, entertainment company in Korea. Yeah. 
Uh, however, in expanding our presence out into global market, I think partnership is one of the key things that we do look for. Uh, if you've been following YG uh, a lot in Japan, China, even US, we do a lot of partnerships in, right. in each of the countries. And one of the key reason is that even though YG understands the Korean market very, very well, and we do everything, I mean, we basically understand how it uh, evolves, basically. But in the other markets, we actually need a good partner who understands the local market better. Right. And they obviously they know better than we do, right? So right. Uh, that's why one of the uh, finding the right partner in, uh, in each of the uh, region is a key thing that we do look for. Right. And the kinds of partners you work with, there's just you know advertising agencies, sync companies, technology companies, whoever makes sense for you to help to bring the music out to the audience, right? Exactly. I think YG, I mean, everybody, when they look at YG, it's all about, you know, entertainment, celebrities, music, concerts. But uh, we actually have much more business, right. even wider than just the entertainment. I think YG has evolved into a company where uh, we started as an entertainment company. We have evolved into a lifestyle company. Now we're evolving into, like, a total media company, basically. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, in the categories you just mentioned, we actually can find multiple partners that of we course. work with. Uh, in different different countries, different markets, basically. Right. And you work with people who really understand those markets and are able to help your music to connect to the audiences. I think that's the key, uh, key focus. Uh, we have to have a group partner who understands the market, who has to reach into that market. Uh, because to be honest, yes, YG is a big company, but still we have our limitations. Basically. Of course. Understood. All right, Mandar, how is, uh, you've, got a, you've got a heck of a lot of content at times. Um, how, do you, how, does, how does Sync uh, help you to, and Sync and partnerships help you to connect your music to the rest of the world, to get people to listen to it and to help monetize it? I think it's a foregone conclusion that Sync and you know, partnerships actually help to get the music out. Now, if you take one step back, yeah. um, within India we have a large culture of film music. It's pretty much musicals all the way. Yep. Um, so for us, it's actually a dichotomy of sorts, right? So on one hand, there are artists that you want to promote, but on the other hand, there are just songs that you want to get across. So we're essentially a song-driven market. Right. India is pretty much in a transformative stage where you're getting the singer-songwriter system, uh, but otherwise, we've always been used, uh, or rather, we've, we've always been used to creating music to a brief. So it's right. like an advertising jingle, right? You get a brief, you get a brand. The same way in a movie, there is a star, and there's a situation, there's somebody running around a tree, or whatever they do, right? And there is a brief that is given. So it's a country with a hundred year old musical legacy and with a legacy of being able to create tracks to brief, to create hits, right? So to be able to work with brands, I think is almost second nature. But having right. said that, like I said, there are two parts to it. One is really the money part, where you're really pasting songs out and hoping, you know, some of them get selected and make lots and lots of money. And on the other hand, uh, it's also a question of making sure that some of your artists are exposed. That goes hand in hand also with streaming. Uh, for us particularly, we, we operate globally through a network of sub-publishers, agents, um, you know, so on and so forth. Sure. One of them is a really good, cool guy. You guys should know him. His name is Mark Fryser. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very kind of you. Thank you. So that, 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 that's how oh, we get. It's, it's so really sweet. easy. You want to get your music across, just call up this guy. But, uh, <laughs> but what tends to happen in that is <laughs> um, there are two things that work, you know, really, and that's trust and relationships, right? right? I think for us, being able to trust our partners and know that on the first day, you're not going to rob the piggy bank, right? right? It takes years and years and years to develop. So for us, it's really both not just exposure to artists, but I think also making sure that a music is heard, we make money off sync, but at the same time, that has a ripple effect on our streaming that we do um, anywhere else. Right, exactly, and that's really the end game of anything that you're seeing. I mean, okay, the end game of a sync, of course, the first part of it is that you know you're going to get paid for the sync, yeah. but then you're you get you're getting music exposed from it, and Absolutely. I see it happen Absolutely. again and again and again. It happens with K-pop all the time. I see, you know, oh my gosh, look, there's a CL song in a commercial. And, and then there's like a Big Bang song that was used in a TV show. And then what happens is that you see all of these people on a service like TuneFind, like just going crazy or in Shazam going crazy trying to figure out what it is. 
and then they start streaming it, and then they start listening to it, and then they go on all K-pop, and they start learning about more stuff, and it just sort of snowballs. So it, that's, that's where I see sync really coming into play. All right, so anyway, going back from that, now I'm going to ask you, Lauren, you know, as you know, I know the Japanese market a little bit, and, you know, one of the things uh, for me is... <clears throat> We don't see a lot of music get synced from Japan, at least, you know, in really big campaigns. Right. Um, is, it, is, it a pri is it a priority for somebody like Sony or just in general for the industry? Um, well, I think it's interesting because the way that it works in Japan, a lot of times those fees are waived, yep. as you know, because it's part of an album campaign. Yep. So a lot of time the focus is instead on the partnership and that it's a sponsorship package or it's an endorsement in a way, or it's a casting. And so the right. artist is in the commercial, but there's not much money moving around the actual music usage. Um, and instead it's part of a larger sort of synergy happening. So while you know we have a partnerships team inside of Sony Music and they go out and they talk to 7-Eleven and they talk to all these snack companies and Bukhari Sweat and they, they get these yeah. great campaigns for our artists, um, but the focus is more on, on the package and the casting and the commercial. And so what's interesting is we don't have much of a strategy around getting international syncs but as our artists have started to perform and distribute their music outside of Japan, some of those sponsorships have carried over. Right. So like one of our big idol groups called Nogizaka 46, it's like 50 young women. Yeah. It's like the AKB. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Nogizaka 46 for years and years, every year they have this huge 7-Eleven campaign and all the 7-Eleven in the country are covered in the Nogizaka 46 girls. They were, you know, it's just seen it's it. everywhere. Yeah. Have you it's seen it? Over, yeah. yeah. So, so when they performed in Taiwan this year, they did in Taiwan, in Taiwanese, you know, a, a commercial that ran nationally and they had an in-store presence in retail and they carried over that campaign through to 7-Eleven in, in Taiwan. That's yeah, really significant. That's crazy. It was right. like a bunch of otaku there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, welcome to, yeah, the idol, yeah. Yeah, exactly. idol world. Yeah, exactly. Otaku <laughs> so, world. So yeah. there's, anyway. there's not, it's very much driven from Japan because everyone is so focused on the domestic market. Yeah. So instead of pitching music supervisors or so on, there's just not those uh, that norm in place. But there's also like, for example, there's a lot of conversations over, there's a Japanese retailer who's expanding in the Chinese market and around Asia, and they license some of our intellectual property in terms of anime. Um, oh. and, uh, and so we're talking to them about having that continue. So we, we tend to sort of, because we're Japan, maybe stick with our Japanese partners, and as we go bit by bit to other countries, try and sort of piggyback against each other and work together, and that's really the, the thing that we've been seeing. Yeah, it is, it is kind of a fascinating, like, uh, a, a, an opposition to the way that other markets work. You know, if you look at, if you look at, like, a group, like, I work with Perfume, which is really big group in Japan, if you don't know them. They're really, really big. And uh, we try to get them uh, some sinks outside. And, you know, it's not easy because they don't uh, sing anything in English. So there's a barrier there. And also J-pop is kind of a special sound. But getting beyond that, there are potential opportunities for them. But in their own market, they don't get paid for commercials, like you said. Everything is promotion. It's promotion for a tour, or it's being inside of the commercial, performing in the commercial, or being a brand ambassador. So the models are very different there. Now, with that said, going back to what you were saying about Taiwan, it's kind of an interesting and unique case, and it might be a case for the future, but I believe you brought a video to illustrate I that, right? I did bring a video. So I brought another video because um, it's, not, it's not the Nogizoka 46 video, but it's another artist that we're really excited about and it's, you know, as the Japanese artists are starting to go outside more and more, thanks to K-pop's amazing success, <laughs> so we're copying you. Um, I just want to show the diversity because <laughs> this is, um, sorry, uh, because it's not just all the idol groups right. and, and so on. This is one of, they're like a neo kawaii band. And right. so they're really weird. They're called Chai. And um, they have a partnership, not in the sense of a brand, but in the sense of there's a label called Burger Records that they're right. working in the U.S. with. 
So well, before maybe, we put that oh. up, tell everybody what uh, Neo Kawaii is. So Kawaii, kawaii is the kawaii. Japanese word for cute. Right. And so they're Neo Kawaii because they're cute, but they're kind of weird. You always have to explain Japanese terms to people outside of Japan. So, so let's yeah, see it. This is a. Uh, yeah, this is them. Um, so, you know, it, it's just really interesting because um, in some sense, the Japanese market is changing a lot as it yeah. shifts to streaming. And so what we've done up until now is getting kind of shaken. And so the classic J-pop is sort of splintering away and we're getting a little more experimental things. And so Chai is a real rising star yeah. in Sony and the strong interest from outside of Japan and from this, you know, very respected indie label wanting to reissue what they're doing, put out on cassette, helped out with the tour, the whole tour down California. Yep. It's been a really um, exciting thing for the company. So. Chai has actually had some really good traction with, you know, like we do a survey, my company does a survey uh, with uh, Promic, which is like the Japanese sort of music association. We do a survey every month of with music supervisors listening to Japanese music. And Chai is one of their real favorites these days yeah. seriously it's yeah, like no, gotten it's, a lot of traction it's very it's it's great so yeah cool all right so um what about what about uh you know anything mandarin uh leaving uh the mandarin speaking market uh how has sync come into play in that our brand partnerships has well, there been anything that you can cite yeah, I mean, uh, for Chinese Mandarin songs, we, I mean, uh, it's actually very much like Japanese situation because, I mean, uh, we're kind of self-sustained. Uh, uh, and uh, usually, I mean, with uh, sync business, we always go with, like, dra you know, uh, mental, mental dramas or uh, movies. And because, I mean, they're everywhere in the world, you know, with the Chinese community. So uh, basically, that uh, that's the way we do. You know, we collaborate with uh, uh, you know Mandarin-speaking dramas and uh, movies. Right. But nowadays, this is a little bit changing because I mean, uh, well, as a Taiwanese, I mean, you, we you we we're a big uh, probably the biggest uh, exporter. Yeah. To China and everywhere in the world, but China is getting stronger and stronger. And it's happening. Eventually, they're going to have their own stars, their own, you know, they're going to use their own songs. And which is even like maybe lower price, you know, to buy or get the, uh, the license fee. And uh, yeah, because I mean, free economy is, you know, is what it is in China. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so for us, uh, not, I mean, Taiwan as part of Southeast Asia, because I mean, it, because of uh, you know the territory, so so close, and we started to thinking about you know maybe out of the comfort zone, we we'll also start you know starting out to explore outside of the uh, Mandarin speaking markets. Uh, and I'm not just talking about for Taiwan, because I mean, recent I, I just came back from Kuala Lumpur, you know, meeting with a lots of uh, Malaysian artists um, <coughs> and singing in English and Malay. So very similar situation like happening in Malaysia and Indonesia and Thailand. 
Right. And uh, everybody is seeking, you know, the difference. So um, I see the trends, like you know, uh, more and more like uniqueness. They're they're doing for their own music. They, if they really want to break out, you know, out of the comfort zone, like uh, like uh, you know. Uh, if you sing in the R and B, you it cannot just pure R and B because basically Americans they invented R and B. You cannot do it better than Americans, right? <laughs> so you have to put it more like I a bit more touch, uh, related to your roots, your your culture, or uh, like um, like Malaysian and Taiwanese, uh, especially I. I really like to, you know, I really like they develop something Aboriginal or ethnic music. So that will be uh, more like, um, how do I say that? Get more attention from uh, the supervisors from, you know, for a uh, sync opportunity. Sure. Otherwise, I mean, it's very difficult to get attention. And uh, also because the rest of the countries, they're not like in Japan, because like Ron said, Japan is a, second biggest entertainment entity in the world. So basically it's also a, a self-sustained uh, uh, market. But rest of the, uh, you know, we're just tiny, tiny and uh, less population. So in order to break out to the world, I think the, uh, the, the <coughs> uniqueness, uniqueness of your music is very important, especially for sync music. Yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I wanted to, I want to just take that, and I want to ask you a question, Charlie, if I can. Um, when you are looking at, and I want everybody to answer this question, and then we'll probably have to end the panel in the interest of time, so I apologize for that. But um, basically, what are the main challenges that you found in terms of export of uh, K-pop? Because we're always focusing on, you know, hey, K-pop is a phenomenon, but how did it get there? You know, and what, how did, how, what were, what were the biggest sort of like barriers that you, that YG found and how did you get past them? Well, I think one of the biggest challenges that I have faced and I'm still facing is actually proving to the South Asian market that the K culture actually exists. Right. I think in a lot of the countries, people follow K dramas, you know, yep. pop songs. People are very familiar with it. But when you're actually trying to bring it over yourself, it's actually a very different story. Um, right. You don't really know. Um, a, lo a lot of people think, you know, K-pop is dying off, k drum is dying off, but still, it's still there. I mean, a lot of countries... I don't think it's dying it. off. Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> some people think he has passed the, uh, the peak. Basically, okay, right? okay. And uh, Which I understand, but I think it's still there. I think it's, uh, the presence is still strong. I think it's a matter of how do I present this to the uh, the partners that I'm talking with to make them a believer of, you know, I don't know, in my sense, I guess, YG culture, right. basically. And I think Could as take... Louder, please? Uh, yep, sorry. <laughs> um, I guess in my endeavor to actually expand the YG uh, presence out in the Asian market, uh, basically, I've talked to a lot of different partners. I've, I've actually come to a phase where I am starting to show them what happens when I bring one of these stars over from IT, basically. Right. So just to give you a brief example, uh, last month I was able to bring Lisa over to Indonesia uh, for, uh, well, for um, I, I wouldn't call it a fan meeting, but uh, artist invitation. And that's one of the major YG artists in the right. YG family. Uh, it's one of the members from the Blackpink. Right. Uh, she's a, a formal ambassador for our cosmetic brand. And, and she speaks Thai, right? She's, yeah, she's a fluent, uh, she's from yeah, Thai. She's from Thailand, Thailand, yeah. yeah. Uh, when I brought her over to Indonesia and Thailand, um, the crowd that was gathered was just overblown. I mean, people were, you know, just crazy just to see her. The malls that we did the events were just full, like from the first floor to the third floor. I mean, the, some of the, uh, I was able to invite uh, the clients that or the partners that I've been working with, and they actually saw what happens when we actually bring one of these people over. Right. And now they start to believe in different things that YG can provide, and they now start to believe, okay, if we work with YG, maybe these are some of the things that we can actually uh, expect going forward. Right. So I think you know it's still a going process. It's an ongoing process. I'm still 
just there will be another uh, a lot of phases where I need to kind of show to them what it is to work right. with YG or with the K-pop countries or you know K uh, K-pop artists. But I think uh, that's how I'm trying to get past the blocks, uh, go over and like, step by step, basically. Yeah, but it sounds like you're making some real progress because once they see that, then they're converted. Uh, I think, yeah, I mean, a lot more people are interested in talking about different opportunities that they want to explore, basically. Right. Now people are taking a little bit more risk. They're willing to take a little bit more risk, I think. Before, you know, they want to see what happens first. Now they're taking a little bit more uh, I guess approach toward working with you know the Korean, uh, the K-pop artists basically. I think. Right. Okay. And from your perspective, Mandar, what is the uh, you know greatest challenge that you have in getting your music outside of your market? Sometimes it's a distance, right. obviously. But luckily for us, the world is flat. Yes. Now, um, <laughs> <laughs> just go on YouTube. You can find just, lots of people yeah. to you know, and support you. Yeah, and and what? Look, I mean, it, it it for us, it's been a long journey. We're an independent label. Um, we really had no. It's it's also cultural dealings. It's just not the way we deal in India. Is not the same way it works in the U.S. or the U.K. I mean, in India, I keep saying it again and again. There are no music supervisors, so you end up hustling to brands right. to whoever buys, right? Like a willing buyer, willing seller system. Yep. But I think when you when you talk about for us, there's a for for India particularly, there's a very large diaspora market, and yeah. two of the biggest markets where we actually get our things from is the U.S. and the U.K. We pretty yeah. much do not bother with the rest of the world. Right. N not saying that if we get a sync, we won't do. I'll jump well, on the course, flight and yeah. get it done. <laughs> but uh, what tends to happen is it's. Uh, it took us a long time to understand the mechanisms, the culturally how that works. Um, and importantly, creative briefs and understanding that. So it's threefold. One is obviously the distance, so you have to be there. It's not that you can sit on the phone and have your uh, friends like Mark Fryser and some of the others just pitch something and hope like hell the penny drops. No, it doesn't work like that. Yeah. It's almost been about seven to eight years that we've been traveling across the world, meeting supervisors, understanding them, building relationships. And at one point, we were the only brown face in a predominantly white audience. So everyone thought of India and they used to say, okay, this guy can get it for us. Yeah, right? you're, you're basically and, India. And, uh, in yeah, LA. and and I think <laughs> that really, really, <laughs> that, well, that's what I keep telling my boss to yeah. send me to LA all the time. Yeah. But anyway, I think uh, that's one big thing. To conquer distance, you have to travel. You have to make the time, the commitment, and understand culture. You will never get that done sitting in one place, right? Mm -hmm. That's one. Number two, I think, is the, the challenge of finding the right partner. Now, this is certainly not easy because everyone wants your repertoire. I think over a period of time, you get to know who the players are. You get to know who's the person who's patient and who you can trust to be patient with, mm -hmm. right? I think that over a period of time develops, right? right? But with that, you have to start seeding your partners to understand your repertoire, right? India is just not about Bollywood. It's about so many other things, right? right? The third thing that happened is that we all always got sinks for diaspora, right? We never got sync for anything else. But like I said, as the world grows flatter over the last two to three years, we've been getting so many crazy things, right? Because yeah. you've got stuff, you know, I mean, uh, who the hell thought that a movie like Crazy Rich Asians would, you know, you may have fat, obnoxious Indians next. I don't yeah. know. Anything, right? Yeah. These are things which... Basically, if you have your ear to the ground, you will know that culture is changing, that it is no longer about export of music. I think, I keep saying it, the world is flat. There's enough diasporas and there's enough people who actually listen to things. Like Charlie was saying, I mean, K-pop. I mean, today there are K-pop fans in India. Yeah. Right? I mean, that is what it is. And as long as you have your ear to the ground, which is number three and the most important, um, those three should be able to get it. And, and I think the fourth one is patience. Right. This is certainly not going to be an easy task uh, to just think that just because you have a lot of repertoire, you're going to get it. I think you're absolutely right. I think patience is a virtue when it comes to internationalization of uh, music. Lauren, what do you think? I'm interested to hear this. I Your mean, that, no, that was amazing. I thought, I think, you know, Manders he broke it down, down, right? Yeah, that was so Manders good. is a smart guy. Yeah, he broke it down. Else to say. <laughs> but OK, then I'm going to ask you a question. Sure. OK. And again, because I, I know a little bit about uh, Japan, one of the things that I think might be a barrier for Japanese music going international is the um, risk reward. That every time, every day that you do something outside of the market, it's such a big market that you're losing money no matter what, right? And how do you, 
how do you deal with that when you're trying to do something that, you know, hey, you know what, there's a really good chance that we could do something international with this. How do you convince people to take that, ch right. take that risk? Well, the good thing about the music business is it's not very logical. <laughs> Because <laughs> you're dealing with artists. <laughs> so well, that's true. It doesn't matter what makes sense. Yeah. Me. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, I think, uh, I think, you know, there's so many players. There's the label or the publisher. Right. Um, you know, Sony, there's this big, you know, huge organization. But then there's the artist managers and the, there's the artists themselves. Right. And either early in their career or later in the career, there's certain artists who are just really, really interested in trying something outside of Japan, you know? And if they're not, it's definitely not gonna happen because in terms right. of incentive financially, there, as we've talked about, there's not much financial incentive to really go out. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, it really comes down to sort of who those people are or alternatively, you know, there's a big, um, Sony Music Japan owns a company called Aniplex, which is right. an anime company, which produces most of the anime. Um, in, in the world almost. And uh, so sometimes the thing will happen where there's a lot of anime consumption outside of Japan and there's a song and the theme song or the ending song, it gets very popular. And so there's sort of an organic growth of interest in a certain artist and then, and then that comes from outside. So I guess Fair it's, enough. you know, either something's kind of buzzing through usually an anime connection um, and then, you know, does that artist or their manager or the people at the label really want to take a jump and try? And, um, you know, we have an artist named Lisa who tours yep. through Asia every year for the last four, four or five years. You know, she's been yeah. really putting in the work and it's starting to pay off. Um, but, you know, and then sometimes the people don't want to and it, it makes sense. But the other thing, too, is as Japan shifts to digital, there's going to be a lot of changes coming. Yeah. You know, right now, streaming is 9% of the market. Download is 9%. Um, the rest of, you know, 70, 80% is all physical CD I was going to say, physical's actually gone up in the last year, yeah, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, yeah. It's very weird. It's, it's in terms, yeah. So, so <laughs> streaming is just, yeah. you know, it's under 10%. Yeah. Right. Um, and so, but it's going to change really, really quickly. When and it shifts, it's yeah, going to shift Yeah, and, and the, yeah. the thing is, it's, as everyone knows, the sales you get off of physical CDs, it's a lot of it's a lot of money, um, and so I think everyone's priorities and incentives might shift very quickly, maybe five years from now. So that's my my answer, I guess. Okay, and yep. June, anything to add? Well, uh, Japan is not the only one. Taiwan also has uh, physical sales, you know, up last year. So many people are. <laughs> it's just the uh, I cannot tell you why, but. Uh, it's more like uh, collecting, you know, some souvenir nowadays, and right. uh, and s because this uh, something to do with the uh, the society population, uh, because of a low fatality rate, like in Japan, so uh, our country is stuck with uh, a lot of uh, old people, and they're still, you know, liking uh, the old days. That's true. Japan too. Yeah, so the same. You know, we could we could do a whole panel on you know. All of, all of these issues that face uh, Japan and the fact that all the old people just buy CDs and you know all of that. But there's more reason to it. But anyway, we can get into that another time. In the interest of time, I can't take another, I can't take any questions. I'm really sorry about that. But if people want to talk to you, can they talk to you afterwards and uh, maybe, uh, you know, uh, pick your brains a little bit? Yeah. You okay with sure. that? Yeah, anyone good. can find me. Okay, good. And we're going to go straight to our next panel. But first, I'd like to uh, ask you to um, give our uh, panelists a hand. Thank you guys so much.